money, teaching. Hey, I want to get involved in that action, man. That sounds great. <laughs> but, 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 but seriously, could you briefly describe what it, I mean, what's the experience of a neophyte who is, or somebody who's, who's coming to a, who's coming to Alexander Technique for therapeutic reasons? What's, what, what can they expect? Well, you suddenly start feeling like you're floating through the world. So when the teacher works with you on walking, as you learn to let go of these unnecessary patterns of compression and, and tension, suddenly everything becomes light and moving through, moving through the world is just like you're floating down, down the street instead of clomping down the street. And when you get in and out of a chair or when you're, when you're talking, suddenly you feel, oh, I'm no longer... You know, I'm no longer stressed. I'm no longer like hunched. Like I used to work in radio, and I had a lot of voice trouble. This was in my late teens, early 20s, and uh, so I've, I've always had this this kind of fear about my voice that it wasn't adequate. I had a father who was such a great public speaker, but he could never communicate to me effectively how he was able to project his voice. And it's only since I've started studying the Alexander technique that I find that I'm able to speak effortlessly for hours without losing my voice. And when I listen back to recordings of my voice now, I, you know, I no longer uh, shudder with horror. Like well, in high school, I was called the squeaking deacon because my <laughs> voice would rise so high that only dogs could hear it. That sounds like good times in, in, in school. Um, I wonder. How, well, I, I wonder if Loma Linda University is going to add a. Uh, at Alexander Technique to their acupuncture and yoga program. I don't know. I did speak at Loma Linda University about a year ago. I was on a panel about Jews and Christians and the Sabbath. How did that, how did that go over? Uh, it was fun. I mean, I was pretty controversial because uh, I said that I didn't think it mattered whether or not non-Jews kept the Sabbath, that the Sabbath was something that was given as a commandment to Jews. And I don't think they were expecting to hear that. I also said that I didn't think that that Seventh-day Adventists keeping the Sabbath made them any more ethical or uh, or moral or upright than uh, mm -hmm. if they didn't keep the Sabbath. And I pointed out how the Seventh-day Adventist church in uh, Germany in the 1930s was solidly behind the Nazis and their hmm. purification program and shipping people off to concentration camps. So. Yeah, that, that, I'm sure that went over like a lead balloon with some of those Yeah, it, it, was, it was a bit of a shock for so some just, people. I mean... I, I mean, is there a part is there a part of your religious outlook that 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 still accepts some of the SDA stuff you were raised with? Oh, absolutely. For instance, I I don't drink. Like I don't like alcohol. That comes from my Seventh Day Adventist upbringing. I don't eat meat. That comes from my Seventh Day Adventist upbringing. I almost never swear. That comes from my Seventh Day Adventist upbringing. There are all sorts of mannerisms and traits and habits that I have that come from my Seventh-day Adventist upbringing. And whenever I step back into a Seventh-day Adventist environment, I feel really at home. It's, it's, it's weird. I can only imagine. Um, another kind of off-the-wall um, angle here is that uh, this show actually has its roots in a rock climbing radio show. Have you ever done any rock climbing, Luke? Well, when I was at Glacier View, I remember that week that, that my father was put on, on trial. And uh, when, when the week was over, we went climbing, we climbed this mountain, and I remember like climbing to the top of this mountain, and I clambered out to this, you know, rock outlay so that there was just this steep, steep drop, you know, below me, and I just I was there on my hands and knees just looking over it, and, sure. and then I was just looking out across the, the Rocky Mountains, and I knew that, that my life would never be the same after this week, and that I couldn't see what the future held for me, and I was quite scared and frightened. So, so um, talk about that just a little bit more, if you would. I mean, I can only. I mean, as a 14-year-old, did you did you understand what was going on, or was it mostly? I mean, it was mostly about kind of the social fabric of your family being being excommunicated from its community. Is, 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 is that I fair thought to say? I knew. Actually, it was kind of the opposite. I thought I I knew the theological issues concerned, but I think what was really going on was more social. Um, dynamics that my father had just made so many enemies at this time he'd made too many enemies and they were going mm -hmm. to shut him down and I was really scared about being moved away from Pacific Union College which I'd lived the the previous three years and I'd started to With make friends, friends there yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, like it felt like all my life we'd been moving and so I was never able to sustain friendships 
And so that made me very sad that I'd be shifted away from my friends at Pacific Union College, that we'd be forced to move again, that life would be um, completely new and different. And uh, I went into a fairly strong depression for for the next year. I was a terrible student in in ninth grade, and uh, I really struggled. I think it's interesting how in... um... I mean, in, in in other venues of life, you know, in business, for example, and in just day to day life, you know, people people make enemies throughout their careers. But it seems kind of ridiculous the kind of the kinds of uh, the kinds of anger and genuine deep hostility that these theological issues incite in, in, in amongst amongst people. Well, they can only incite anger if people take them seriously. So, if you take religion seriously, then any threats to your religious faith. Uh, or to your religious practice are going to be huge stimuli for for you to react with anger. So it doesn't surprise me that people lose friendships and fight over over religious issues. I think the propensity to be religious is largely genetic. Uh, For instance, my brother's an atheist and he just doesn't have a religious bone in his body. And on the other hand, I basically have my father's uh, religious drive, and the, I've, I've expressed it completely differently. But you know, I have the same obsession with religion that, that my father has, and so you know, I see many people who are raised with religion, but they have no feeling for religion. So that when they become adults, they completely leave religion. Right. And uh, I, I think it's uh, largely genetic. Well, here's a question: I don't think um, I don't. I, I I wouldn't expect most people to to choose to or be able to answer honestly, but you know, to what extent? And this is this is just a kind of I'm just I'm just kind of throwing this out there. To what extent is uh, is your religion about the uh, the culture and the society and the and the and you know kind of the the social fabric as opposed to uh, a, a true mad deep um, belief? Well, the first thing is that Judaism isn't Christianity without Christ, so it's a completely different approach to religion from Christianity. So, for instance, faith plays very little role in Judaism. Uh, love plays, you know, a, a minor role compared to the, you know, it's the thing that Christians are always talking about: love, love. God loves you. I love you. Let's all love one another. <laughs> um, that, the the focus in Judaism is much more on justice focuses much more on behavior, it focuses much more on learning, focuses much more on law. It's a very unromantic religion. So what what got me into Judaism was that I saw it as the best way to make a good world, that it was a step-by-step detailed system for morally educating people that that had no no equal as as evidenced by the disproportionate effect of of Jews on the world. So I kind of went from a world where Seventh-day Adventists were essentially irrelevant to the world, mm-hmm. to Jewish life where Jews were at the, the center of what was going on, where the most talk in the United Nations is always about the Jewish state of Israel, where I go to synagogue and I meet you know, people who ruined with President Bush when he was getting his MBA at Yale, or people who are directing movies, or people who are writing novels, or you know, people who operate large businesses. So I, I've enjoyed the the transition from irrelevance to being in the center of what's going on but my my primarily mo- motivation for converting to orthodox Judaism is that I believe that in God and that God gave the Torah the Bible to the Jewish people and that he has a unique uh, set of practices and standards and behaviors for his chosen people and he wants them to embody his his values his, his uh teachings of ethical monotheism uh, for the entire world, that the Jews are to call humanity to Mount Sinai, to a morally demanding God. And it's that belief that, that motivated my conversion to Judaism, and that's why I choose each day anew to live as a Jew. What's the uh, dating scene like for a convert to Judaism in, in, in Los Angeles? Uh, you basically get what you deserve. So. <laughs> as do we all, or as all, yeah, ultimately, yes. Yeah, so I've never been married, and I think that's that's primarily my fault. I think it's, it's a reflection of my own uh, shortcomings of, of character and psychology and, and earning and, and uh, accomplishment. 
So it's, I mean, there are definitely some challenges. I think the more you have in common, the, the 